Hey, Faye family, it's Brother Mario. I pray you're having a wonderful day. I wanted to go ahead and create a video here to share with you my thoughts on a recent news story involving a Christian rock band by the name of Hawk Nelson, who are making headlines this week because their lead singer, Jonathan Stangard, shocked the world when he revealed on Instagram that he no longer believes in God. And so I wanted to make this video here today to look at the Instagram post and respond to some of the objections that Jonathan made and also to raise up the question amongst believers, why is this happening? Keep in mind, Jonathan was a pastor's kid. He grew up in the church. He grew up in a Christian home. He was the lead singer of a Christian band. Yet here we are today and he has announced on Instagram that he's fallen away. Is there something that the church is lacking that could have helped him to be able to stand firm and not have his doubt overtake his faith to the point that his faith has been completely snuffed out? So that's what today's video is all about. Let's get right into it. Now, I believe that the church is lacking in a certain area. You know, when it comes to youth groups, more and more, it's all about entertaining them. We're not so concerned about truth and Bible study. Now, keep in mind, this is not all churches. I'm generalizing. But from what I've witnessed, there is a leaning towards entertaining youth groups, doing events that revolve around entertainment and fun rather than the Bible. And so what we find is that kids are growing up in the church here today without a very basic, essential grounding in the basics of the faith. Apologetics is a branch of Christian theology that answers these questions that Jonathan and some of you have. If you've never heard of apologetics, I strongly encourage you to begin your study of it. When it comes to questions of the problem of evil, why would a good God allow evil things to occur? This is where Christians find our source of strength because the Christian faith is based on reasonable, sound, logical answers. And apologetics is the branch of theology that provides that to the believer. And so I feel like youth groups should be focusing more on apologetics. So we don't have individuals growing up within the church, within a pastor's home, who still are struggling and wrestling with these questions. Keep in mind, it's okay to doubt. Everyone has doubt. You ever heard of the expression, doubting Thomas? It comes from the Bible. One of the disciples, Thomas, did not believe even by seeing Jesus physically, that Jesus was in fact who he said he was and that he had resurrected. Thomas had to touch Jesus's wound in order to believe. And so there's some of you out there that are doubting Thomas's and that's okay. God loves you and God wants to provide you an answer or a foundation for your faith so that doubt does not overtake you, just like it has here with Jonathan. And so that's what I'm going to just say in the beginning of this video. I just feel like the church is really lacking in this area of being able to equip. We're so focused on entertainment and not truth that we are not really giving people like Jonathan a good shot at continuing to stand firm in the faith when it comes to standing against doubt. So let's go ahead and look at his Instagram post. All right, so here's the post on Instagram. Let's take a moment here and analyze it. This is not a post I ever thought that I would write, but now I feel like I really need to. I've agonized whether to say this publicly, and if so, how to do it. But now I feel that it's less important how I do it, and more important that I do it. So here it goes. And I just want to state before getting into this, good on you, John. It is very hard to be honest. It takes a lot of courage. So good on you for at least being honest and courageous enough to be honest. That's great. After growing up in a Christian home, being a pastor's kid, playing and singing in a Christian band, and having the word Christian in front of most of the things in my life, I am now finding that I no longer believe in God. All right, so let's take this into context here, brothers and sisters, as we analyze this story in order to understand what's going on. We have someone here who's grown up in a Christian home. His dad's a pastor and everything around him is Christian. Yet here today, he no longer believes in God. So let's examine why that is. The last few words of that sentence were hard to write. I still find myself wanting to soften that statement 
by wording it differently or less specifically, but it wouldn't be as true. The process, okay, here's something important as well. Highlight this. The process of getting to that sentence where he no longer believes in God has been several years in the making. It didn't happen overnight or all of a sudden. It's been more like the pulling on the threads of a sweater and one day discovering that there was no sweater left. All right, notice this. This is not an overnight thing. It's not like all of a sudden, one day he has all the faith in the world and then he wakes up the next day and he no longer believes. This was a gradual, subtle process. And so when it comes to the attack of the enemy to destroy your faith, take note of this, that he will subtly and frequently come after you in order to plant seeds of doubt within you until eventually they ripen and grow and overtake your faith. Let's continue. I have been terrified to be honest about this publicly for quite some time because of all that I thought I would lose. I'm still scared, but I'm writing about this now for a few reasons. Firstly, I can simply no longer avoid it. Processing this quietly felt right when I simply had doubts. But once they had solidified into a genuine point of view, it began to feel dishonest not to talk about it. And so what we see here is that he's telling us that he, in essence, had doubts that eventually came into full-blown manifestation of a worldview that no longer accepts the reality of God. And now this is very important as well in church. Pay attention to what he's about to say here. Secondly, I've had private conversations with trusted friends about my doubts and discover to my absolute shock that they are shared by nearly every close friend my age who also grew up in the church. I am stunned by the number of people in visible positions within, the Christ within Christian circles that feel the same way I do. Like me, they fear losing everything if they're open about it. I hope that my openness and transparency can be an encouragement to them, to you, if you feel the same. And so I just want to state out here, brothers and sisters, it's okay to have doubts. Don't be ashamed and hide your doubt in the darkness. Like what we're seeing stated here that his experience by being in the church is that so many people who claim to follow after Jesus are harboring these doubts within themselves. Jesus is the truth. Pursue the truth. Go after the doubt. Seek out the answers in Christian apologetics to create a sound foundation for your faith. And so you won't be struggling with these questions. Okay, let's continue. Thirdly, I got a whole lot less to lose now. The band isn't playing shows or making new music at the moment. And we found other work and careers to focus on for the time being in order to make sure that I can keep providing for my family. That had to be the case before I could be totally, totally honest. And that fact is one of those issues I have with the church and the Christian culture in general. Well, I don't understand why you have an issue with that. Um, if you're going to be a spokesperson for the Christian faith, well, you should be a strong believer. Um, people put into positions of leadership, even in Christian music, should at least have a sound um, discipleship, especially when it comes to basic theological questions that people like John is bringing up. So if you're someone who follows me because of Hawk Nelson and my involvement in Christian music, you're now probably thinking, wait, were you lying to me this whole time? Were you just pretending to be a Christian? What about all those songs you wrote? Did you mean those? The short answer is I was not lying. I did believe in those things at the time. I may have been pulling on threads of the, of the sweater, but there was still some sweater left back then. So what did this sweater thread pulling process look like? Okay, let's get into it. All right, so let's pay attention here because he's about to describe his falling away. And this is important. Maybe your child or someone you know within the church. Remember, he just said there's many of us out there that claim to follow Jesus that in fact are struggling with this, okay? So let's analyze what happened here. I grew up in a Christian home, loving Christian home. My dad was a pastor, and still is. And as far back as I can remember, life was all about the church. You see, this, I'll just pause, you know, that's the problem. His life was all about the church and not Jesus. 
the church had become an idol in his life. He didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He had a relationship with the church, if you know what I mean, in a false, spiritually dead religious sense. He was performing religious ritual in a Christian local church, but was spiritually dead. Okay, um, so his life was all about the church, not all about Jesus. Your life needs to be all about Jesus first, then the church, not church, then Jesus, if you know what I mean. It's a little complicated, but I think many of you can comprehend what I'm saying here. It feels important to point out that church wasn't something we went to once a week. It was more like something we came home to as often as possible after bravely venturing out into the world when necessary. It wasn't part of our lives. It was our life. When you grow up in a Christian community that holds shared belief and shared beliefs so incredibly central to everything, you simply adopt it. Everyone was close, uh, that I was close to believed in God, accepted Jesus into their hearts, prayed for signs and wonders, participated in church and youth groups, conferences, etc., and ministries, and so did I. Now, I just want to state here, notice what he's saying here is that the reason that he's going to church is because it's a tradition. It's a man-given tradition from his family. Now, it's not a bad thing, but what we're seeing here is that the reason that he's going to church is not for truth, it's for tradition. And that's the problem. He's going there because the tradition of his family, his friends, those around him and his community is to go to church. He's not going to church for the truth, to have a relationship with Jesus, to deepen his faith. He's going because those around him do so, and he doesn't want to stick out and be different. But that is not a valid, genuine reason for attending the local church. The whole point of the local church is to strengthen an already saved believer who wants to be there by their own desire and to strengthen them. Okay? It's not a place where we can perform religious acts and ceremonies in order to have a career that we can have, etc. Okay? I became interested in music, began playing and singing on worship teams, and started leading worship and church events. Even then, I remembered being uncomfortable with certain things praying, like praying in public that always felt like some kind of weird performance art. Well, Jesus said that those who pray in public seeking for the approval of others are doing so because they're self-righteous hypocrites. I'm not saying that all public prayer is bad, but uh, sometimes if you get that vibe that it's a performance art, it's because you're watching a self-righteous hypocrite perform a public prayer like Jesus explained in the Sermon on the Mount in order to draw attention to themselves, to be perceived by men and women around them as righteous. And Jesus called this out as religious hypocrisy. And then he goes on to say, Emotional cries such as the Holy Spirit come fill this place always felt clunky and awkward leaving my lips. A youth conference I attended encouraged every teen to sign a pledge that they would date Jesus for a year. It felt manipulative and unsettling to me. I didn't sign it. Now, I just want to point something out here. It really does look like John was forced by his own self to want to please his parents or maybe his parents' desire for him to attend church. He was there for the wrong reasons. What you're going to see is that an individual like this does not possess the Holy Spirit and the new heart to have even the desire to do those things. You know, for uh, the last 12 months, I have decided to work on my relationship with Jesus and I've stayed single. I've avoided relationship. Now, I wouldn't ever... Um, make someone sign a contract, I think that's a little bit insane and, and pushing it too far. But I definitely do encourage people right now, uh, especially the youth out there, to take a time of singleness to work on healing. You know, a lot of us are getting into relationships when we're codependent. We are seeking to find validation and fulfillment within a partner or a relationship. And we are ending up in toxic love cycles. And so for me to overcome and heal that, I've decided to work on my relationship with Jesus, heal from codependency and toxic attachment styles, which I've been doing, and it's a fantastic thing. And so as a Christian, I encourage my brothers and sisters to do such thing if God calls you to and it's appropriate for your life. Um, but I would never make you sign anything. And so what I'm seeing from this is someone who just doesn't have the Holy Spirit within them because they don't desire to do the things. If, if praying, worshiping, and all this is always something you need to force, I mean, it's not like we're always going to want to do the things of the Spirit. Sometimes it does take a little 
push, you know, to get going. Um, but if you never want to all the time, it could be a sign that your, your heart's not truly transformed, that the Holy Spirit doesn't abide in you. So that's just something I want to point out here that uh, from this I'm seeing here that we're not seeing a genuine desire for the things of the Spirit, which oftentimes is a fruit of a false conversion. Let's continue. I figured I was overthinking all these things. This was the beginning of my doubt, and I began to develop the reflex of simply push it, to simply push it down and soldier on. After all, everyone I knew and loved believed in God, Jesus, and the Bible, so I felt it must be true. And so here, guys, notice this. The reason for him to believe that the Bible is authentic, that he can trust the inspired word of God, is because those around him believed in Jesus. Notice he says that. After all, everyone I knew loved and believed in God, so it must be true. Here he is telling you my foundation for the reason that I believed were those around me. And that every time doubt would rise up in me, I developed a habit, a reflex of not pursuing truth, not looking for the answer in apologetics and seeking good theology. No, no, no. By suppressing the doubt, pushing it down as if that's going to deal with it. Well, eventually things that are suppressed, 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 bottle up and blow up. And that's what happened. Instead of actively seeking out the answers and truth as a truth seeking believer, he learned to just push down the doubt until eventually that doubt was so huge within the depths of his soul from having been pressed down there that it literally rotted like a cancer, his faith. At age 20, I joined Hawk Nelson and began touring with the band. It was a blast. Our music wasn't overly Christian. I'm going to skip this part. He talks about how they basically uh, started to write Christian music. He had a huge uh, influence on that. But where I want to fo focus in here is that last par paragraph. If God is all loving and all powerful, why is there evil in the world? Can he not do anything about it? Does he choose not to? Is the evil in the world a result of the desire to give us free will? Okay, then what about the famines, the diseases, the floods, and all the suffering that isn't caused by humans or our free will? If God is loving, why does he spend send people to hell? And so what we see here are very fundamental Christian objections. And like I said, they are very valid. In fact, they are probably the strongest, most valid arguments or objections to the Christian faith. I'll give John that. But still, it is important for us, and I want to stress this to everyone listening to this video, that we, every single individual listening to this video, takes it upon themselves to be a truth seeker. Don't believe something because those around you believe or what you've seen, what you hear me saying here. You seek out truth. Jesus said, if you knock, it will be opened. If you seek, you will find. Ask, and it will be given to you. And so it is with truth. Pursue truth, and God will reveal this to you. Don't just believe it because Mario said it in a video, because John said it in an Instagram post, because an atheist said it in an article or a video, because a Buddhist said this, because he or she said that. Pursue it yourself. And those of you who have the Holy Spirit will be led into truth. I assure you that. Okay? So I just want to state here, I could take the time, but it would be very long to answer all of these questions. I encourage the listener here to be a truth seeker and to pursue within the realm of Christian apologetics, that branch of theology. I, I encourage you to seek within it those answers. But I'll give you a uh, brief illustration. Uh, John is objecting to God's goodness on the basis of certain things in the Old Testament. You know, how could God send floods, etc. A very common objection to the Christian faith is, well, look at the Old Testament. We have an evil God who flooded the world. He only preserved Noah. What? It was Noah his little favorite? Everyone else was, you know, the outcast and God was some evil controlling God who just wanted to be evil and judge the world in such evil ways? No. The thing is, we don't look at the actual context when we fall for this false interpretation of the scripture. The Bible says that the people in Noah's day were completely evil, that every single thought of their minds was consistently evil. So that means that every single thought revolved around murder, hate, lying, stealing, killing, disease, everything. Everything that's wrong with the human vile 
corruption of morality that we can find ourselves in was manifest in their mind in a continual perpetual loop where this is all these people ever thought about so what god was doing in essence is ridding the earth of a cancer because man who completely collapses morally so that every thought of the mind is evil is a threat to themselves and their fellow man and so god was making the sovereign good decision to wipe out this cancer, this plague, which was a completely collapsed moral humanity. And the only people that had remained righteous was Noah. That is why he was preserved. So that righteousness, goodness, honesty, love, being good to one another could continue after the flood. And God could put an end temporarily to this massive sin that we find in Noah's day. And over and over, I can go over these examples in the scriptures and and we can do this, but this is very basic Christian apologetics. And I've already taken so much time in your video here today. uh, I don't want to take too much time to answer this. But again, why does God, a loving God, have something like hell? Well, he's love, but he's also just. The Bible says that God is holy. And so I am happy that we have a good God that one day will judge evil. If there's no hell, there's no judgment. That just means that we can get away with anything today and that no one will be held accountable because we know that the human court systems are corrupt. So praise God, there is going to be a divine court and there is going to be a divine judgment where everyone will be given in accordance to their deeds. And so we see this in the scriptures that God has divine justice. Yes, he is love, but he's also just. And that is why he has created hell. And hell was even was not even created for humanity. It was created for Satan and his angels. And so we see again, the heart desire of God here is to redeem man. That That's why he sent his son. Okay, so again, I can take a lot of time here and we can go into it. But I encourage everyone out there to just look into a Christian apologist for a deepening of that. And possibly this will be something that I'll take more time in a future video and uh, we'll analyze that in more depth. But I just wanted to make a video here to bring this up because I think it's very telling of the falling away. Maybe some of you out there have sons and daughters who, like John, are struggling with this. And this video, I I just pray, was enlightening to you to understand that, hey, maybe we should, you know, take some time and really answer some of the objections that they have. Look at apologetics and look at the Christian answers to these tough questions, you know. Christianity is not scared of questions. We have the answers. The Bible has the answers. So never shy away, mom and dad. Take the time. God will show you the truth. Jesus is the truth. And so we need the young ones out there to be discipled in a way that they pursue truth. So there you have it, everyone. Just wanted to share that with you. Continue to stand strong. Take some time. Strengthen your faith in Christian apologetics and uh, provide answers to those around you who are struggling in their faith. Have a blessed and wonderful day. Stay vigilant, stay sober, and fear no evil.